in Christianity we have a proverb that dates from Jesus Christ our Lord. The first will be last, and the last will be first. So, in this symposium, I'm very honored to be one of the last uh, in this uh, place. My responsibility is to introduce Stefan Rodlin for his uh, participation and uh, towards a new concept of uh, mission, the dimension, contemplative dimension of mission. Please. Thank you very much, uh, Eve. I want also first to share my gratitude and also the insight uh, which gave me to link this special jubilee of 20 years with this special topic. It's, I felt very enriched in my studies through this French approach to spirituality. And so tomorrow we will actually honor these uh, French uh, saints, Jean de Pébeuf, uh, Isaac Clark, and also we should think about the, their tertiary master, Louis Lallemand, who was accused by somebody to have a spirituality uh, not proper for the Jesuits, as he very much emphasized the importance of contemplation. But I think if we look into their life testimony of these so-called French-Canadian martyrs, we see this intimate link between uh, contemplation, mission, and uh, martyrdom. So I want to uh, share with you this contemplative dimension of mission and uh, not just to narrow-minded focus the 20 years maybe, yes, we celebrate of the Macau Rich Institute together with our friends from Taipei Rich Institute and we think also of Paris and San Francisco but as maybe an important step also 20 years ago of an insight of uh, John Paul II to really tap much more into the wisdom traditions of Asia. So that's what I want to uh, simply share with you. Why also to choose this topic? It's the ambiguity of the term mission. So even among the church people, if you talk about mission, they feel kind of uh, maybe uh, skeptical in terms what does it really mean uh, to impose my Christian values on others. So I see this as, as we say in Chinese, a uh, crisis, a uh, veiji, also which includes an opportunity and the risk of mission. As I was referring to a meaning what is faith, uh, according to the specialist of St. Paul Robert Baumann, is the courage to trust the mood to travel. And another point uh, I want to touch, what is the contemplative dimension of mission and how it relates to the witness of the martyrs. So, looking actually at these two fellows uh, embarking into a new uh, world, we also of course have to be kind of aware uh, it misses out other important missionaries, which are not just these priest missionaries, but lay missionaries are as important. But it's true, as uh, Karl Rauna pointed out, that something really new of the Second Vatican Council was to stress that lay and religious priest missionaries are absolutely on the same level. So the questions we have to face is, does mission imply to impose Western values on other cultures? Does it imply a subtle sense of superiority and uh, disregard? And finally, which is the philosophical and theological foundation of mission? We recall this kind of 
sense of frustration of the Jesuits when they concluded the general congregation in 95. They felt we need a new kind of theology of mission. And I'm not sure that we kind of completed this task in the last 24 years. So here is for me a key passage in this uh, encyclical letter, Evangelii Gaudium, The Joy of the Gospel, number 264, when the Pope says the best incentive for sharing the gospel comes from contemplating it with love. But if this is to come about, we need to recover a contemplative spirit which can help us to realize ever anew that we have been entrusted with a treasure which makes us more human and helps us to lead a new life. Now here comes uh, the collection of four uh, gentlemen. There's maybe one important missing. I want to share with uh, a friend, uh, Father Ludwig Kaufmann, shared our three personalities of the church. We're really opening a new door. So the first was John 23rd. So maybe he is missing here. And then the second, Charles de Foucault. And third, Oscar Arnulfo Romero. But I think we have to bear in mind when it comes to definition of mission, we refer to Paul VI Evangelium Nunciandi on evangelization in the modern world in 1975. Uh, a groundbreaking encyclical letter. And then what I think was a dimension which easily overlooked in the thinking of John Paul II, this mission in Asia, Missio in Asia, uh, he was particularly uh, keen on, and what Father Kolverbach, the former general, shared, he had frequently to deal with John Paul II, he had this Millerist view, so this uh, sense that Asia might be extremely important in this process of uh, this new mission. And uh, in the case of Benedict, uh, he also refers to uh, Paul VI for the modern way of uh, social doctrine of the church with popularum progressio, so with a more philosophical, theological approach and as already some of our speakers as a father Meyer touched on uh, Evangelii Gaudium also when also he had some very provocative thought, provocative insights on for instance economic economic which kids see so therefore it's so important for uh, Pope Francis to challenge as to reflect on a new model of economics that will be prominent next year in March 26-28 in Assisi where gathering I think uh, Nobel Prize winners and especially young people reflecting how can we change the paradigm of economics by being restricted just to profit maximization and cost cutting. So milestones also, I recall also some also insights of a mission which is with and for the poor. I think a milestone is also, uh, Father Martin Meyer uh, very nicely pointed out, was the Latin American Bishops Conference seen in Medellin, 1968, uh, and confirmed in Puebla in 1979 as this preferential option for the poor, the option preferential uh, para los pobres, and in the realm of the Jesuits was, I think, maybe the most groundbreaking general congregation uh, was GC32, this option for faith and justice. And 
uh, I think for a good number of us, for the whole church, the witness of Archbishop Arxcar Arnolfo Romero, uh, assassinated in 1980, was really a milestone. And I was, you know, know, know this story that also John Paul II was so keen to include uh, Romero in the list of these martyrs which shaped also the new image of the church. Now, the challenge of Asia, Christianity, with the exception of the Philippines and South Korea, represents a small minority. Now here, also challenge for our uh, symposium, could it offer a special opportunity to broaden the scope of mission through the dialogue with the traditions <coughs> of wisdom, such as Confucianism, especially Buddhism and Taoism, that's what uh, Father Jaroslav Durai will be doing, because this was this insight of the founding father, Yves Hagen, and Islam. So, here is Evangeli Nunziandi, is always reflection on Vatican II. Also, I think it's a misunderstanding if some put John Paul II in the box, he's conservative. When you look at one of his most inspiring last book, Memory and Identity, most quotes actually are from Vatican II. So here is the definition of evangelization by Second Vatican. He is especially referring to Lumen Gentium, uh, Gaudium et Spes and Ad Gentis. And as uh, Cardinal Bölbach also reminded as always, Lumen Gentium, who is this light for the Gentiles? not the church, but uh, Jesus Christ is the light of the Gentiles. So it's a renewal of humanity as popular progressio, this humanization of the economy. So for the church, evangelizing means bringing the good news into all the strata of humanity and through its influence transforming humanity from bidding and make it a new. Evangelii Pensiandi 18. So we have this, all these mutually enriching key elements, as you see, witness, then explicit pronunciation, uh, and we have also the inner adherence, so really embracing these uh, values, uh, and entry into community, renewal of humanity, exception of the sign, and also uh, an apostolic initiative. Here I think a groundbreaking uh, document of Ecclesia in Asia, outcome of the Bishop's Conference, and for us I think a special uh, challenge. Just as in the first millennium, the cross was planted on the soil of Europe, and in the second, that of America and Africa, we can pray that in the third Christian millennium, a great harvest of faith will be reaped in this vast and vital continent of Asia. The Asian context Jesus as Savior, the Holy Spirit, as Lord and giver of life. Proclamation of Jesus in Asia, with a focus on inculturation, communion and dialogue for mission, with a focus on ecumenical and interreligious dialogue, the service of human promotion, and Christians as witnesses to the gospel. So the peoples of Asia need Jesus Christ and his gospel, Asia, is thirsting for living water that Jesus alone can give. <coughs> so, the disciples of Christ in Asia uh, must therefore, by um, assisting in their efforts to fulfill the mission they have received from the Lord, who has promised to be by them at the end of the age. So here this is uh, this 
Ten. So it's and finished. I have one more minute. <laughs> so this is an unfinished uh, mission. Uh, uh, at least 15 minutes I have. <laughs> so uh, and I would like to call actually somebody, uh, Father Ivka, we know personally. We reach out in our mission to this effective internet. Eric de Honig, uh, was, I have this picture of George Tinnery, so his daily life. He said he wanted to go to China but was not able to go there and he self-critically said we have not reached in our mission in Africa the larrière pays affective of uh, the people in Africa and so when we now try to more gear develop an Asian uh, mission in Asia, we have to conclude this unfinished business by also trying to reach out to this effective internet. Uh, thank you very much.